So in this lecture, we're going to talk about projectile motion. Now before we get into projectile motion, let's recall what linear motion is. Now we already spoke about linear motion and we said that it's simply the motion of an object or the movement of an object in one dimension. So let's say for example our object is a ball. Now if our ball is moving in linear motion, that means it's moving either along our x-axis in either direction or along our y-axis. So our ball is allowed to move either sideways or up and down. And we said that if our, if our object is moving in linear motion and under constant acceleration, we have four equations that we can use to find either velocity, the time, displacement, or our acceleration. So now let's look at projectile motion. Projectile motion refers to objects moving in two dimensions. So now our objects aren't moving in a straight line, they're moving in a curved path. For example, if our soccer player runs and kicks this ball, that ball will travel up as well as it will travel sideways. And that's because the force with which our soccer player kicks the ball points sideways, points at an angle. And that means that our velocity vector at the initial position of time equals zero will point this way. So our velocity is at some angle with our ground, with our x-axis, where this is our angle. Now, note that now we can break this guy down into two components because every vector can be broken down into its two components. So we have a y component as well as a x component. So, note the following important point. We cannot or we can no longer use our linear motion equations directly. The equations we derived when we spoke about linear motion, we cannot use them directly. We cannot apply them to this vector here because this vector is not moving in a linear fashion because it follows a parabolic curve. So, what we can do is, if we separate our projectile motion into its components, the same way we did here for the y component and x component, now we can use our formulas directly. And that's because, in this case, our object is moving up in a, in a linear fashion. And our object is moving this way in a linear fashion as well. So, moving up and down and left and right. So now, instead of having three equations, and I'm not including the equation for average velocity, we have six equations. Three for the x direction and three for the y direction. So for example, the displacement in the x direction, in the horizontal direction, is given by the following formula. Where our x, our position at the final point, equals position at the initial point in the x direction, plus our initial velocity vector in the x direction, times the time plus one-half times acceleration in the x direction going this way times our time squared. Likewise, we can, we can find the same displacement or a similar analogous displacement just in the y direction. So, our position in the y direction, our final position in the y direction is equal to our initial position in the y direction plus our initial velocity in the y direction plus one-half our acceleration in the y direction times our time squared. And, and the same applies for these two formulas. So now let's find the formulas that will give us our magnitude of our component vector. So we want to find a formula or two formulas that will give us our magnitudes of the x component vector as well as the y component vector. So let's look at our illustration once more. Now our ball travels in a parabolic motion, a parabolic function, and its initial velocity points in this direction at an angle of theta to our ground, to our x-axis. So we can draw our y component vector and x component vector in the following way, where I simply took my y component and placed it here so that we can see that this is in fact a triangle. Now this magnitude and direction the same exact as this one, as if we drew the vector here. So it doesn't matter if we draw it here or here, our result will be the same. 
but this way we can see that it's a right triangle because our x component and y component vectors are always perpendicular to one another. So now we can use our trigonometric functions or equations to find our magnitude of x component vector as well as the y component vector knowing what the angle is and knowing the magnitude of our initial vector pointing in this direction. So if we know this side and this angle, we can find this side as well as this side. So remember that sine of this angle theta is equal to opposite divided by hypotenuse and cosine of this same angle is equal to adjacent divided by hypotenuse. In this case, our hypotenuse is simply our initial vector, initial velocity. And our adjacent is sine that's adjacent to this angle, which is simply this guy. And our opposite side is simply the side opposite to our angle, so it's this side. So now we can replace or place this guy into our opposite and we can place this vector into our hypotenuse. Likewise, we can place the adjacent or replace our adjacent with this value and replace our hypotenuse with this value. And we get that sine of theta is equal to component in the y direction divided by our initial magnitude of our velocity. And if we bring this guy to this side, we see that our formula for our component or vector component pointing upward is this formula here. It's sine theta of our initial velocity. Likewise, if we bring this guy to this side, we see that our formula to find our x component of velocity is this guy. We simply multiply cosine of that angle by our initial magnitude of our velocity. So we just saw that any object traveling in a parabolic projectile motion will always have two components of velocity. One will point along the y direction and one will point along the x direction. In other words, if we take the following object that's undergoing projectile motion along this parabolic curve, if we choose any point along this curve, we will be able to find two components of velocity one pointing along our y direction and one pointing along our x-axis. Now in the same way that at any given point we can find two velocity vectors, two components of velocity, we can likewise find two components of acceleration because acceleration is in fact a vector. So that means we have a component of acceleration along the x-direction as well as the component or a component of acceleration along the y-direction. Now, it is always the case that our acceleration along the x-direction will be 0 meters per second squared. And it will always be the case that our acceleration along the y-direction is pointing downward and the magnitude is 9.81 meters per second second. And that means because this is zero, our velocity along the x component, along the x axis, is constant. And that means that if we begin with some velocity vx, then along every point we will have the same velocity along the x direction. So this red vector will always have the same direction as well as the same magnitude. And that's because our object is not accelerating along the x direction. But when we talk about the y direction, things become different. This number is always the same, so it's constant, and it always points downward. And that's exactly why our v subscript y, our velocity along the y direction, will not stay the same, will not stay constant. It will change uniformly according to this change in acceleration. So, whatever velocity in the y direction we begin with, as we get higher and higher along our path, it will begin to decrease until we get to this point at which point this vector has a magnitude of zero. So it's actually not pointing in any direction. And our velocity along this direction is zero. However, our velocity along the x direction still stays the same. It's equal to whatever our vx was given initially. Also notice that the velocity vector in the y direction is pointing up up until we get to this point. At this point, it switches direction and our object begins to travel downward. And that's exactly why our vector in the y direction, velocity vector, 
points downward until it hits the ground. So this H, by the way, represents the maximum height that our object can reach when it travels along this path. And this D represents our displacement from the point where it is catapulted up to the point where it hits the ground. So I want to ask the following important question. What dictates or what determines the time of our flight? What determines how long our ball is in the air or our object is in the air? Well notice because our acceleration along the x direction is zero, <coughs> our velocity along the x-direction will be constant and that means y subscript or v subscript y our velocity along the y-direction alone dictates how long an object remains in the air. In other words, let's look at the following example to better understand what I'm talking about. If our initial velocity is 10 meters per second and the angle with which the vector points upward is 60 degrees, then we can easily find our velocity along the y direction by simply multiplying 10 by cosine 60. Since cosine 60 is simply 1 half, 1 half times 10 gives us 5 meters per second. So our velocity vector or component of velocity along the y direction is 5 meters per second. And to find our time that our ball is in the air, we have to use the following equation. Now before we use this equation, let me point out the following important point. Whenever our object travels in a projectile parabolic motion, whenever it gets to this point, to this point where our h is the maximum height and our velocity pointing up is zero, so our vertical velocity is zero, this pathway will mirror whatever this pathway is. So whatever this pathway is, this pathway will be exactly the same except in the opposite direction because it's a mirror image of this pathway. And that means whatever time that it took the ball to reach this point, this point to this point will be the same amount of time. So say if it took the ball to travel five seconds to get to this point, that means it will take it five more seconds to travel to this point. So altogether it will travel for 10 seconds. So that point will become important in the following example. So we want to solve this formula for t because that will give us the total time that our ball traveled along this path. So let's solve for t and we get our vy final minus vy initial divided by a equals our t, where a is our acceleration due to gravity. This is our initial velocity, so five meters per second, uh, five meters per second, and this is our final or our initial velocity, and this is our final velocity, which is also five meters per second in the opposite direction. In other words, because this is a mirror image, whatever velocity my ball begins with it's going to end with that same velocity. It's going to hit the ground with that same velocity. So that means our V final is simply 5 meters per second and our V initial is also 5 meters per second. And we get 5 plus 5, so 10, divided by 9.81 meters per second squared gives us 1.02 seconds. So this is the total flight of our ball during this time. And we only have to use our velocity in the y direction to find this answer. Now notice what I did. I said that my initial velocity was negative and my final velocity was positive. That's how I got this. But what I could have said was that my initial velocity was in fact positive and my final velocity was in fact negative. What I, wouldn't, what I would have gotten is the same result. I would have got negative 5 minus 5 would give me negative 10 and then since my acceleration is pointing down where I divide by negative 9.81 and I get the same result. My negatives cancel and I get 1.02 seconds. So the direction that you choose for positive and negative is relative. It's whatever you want it to be as long as the directions are consistent throughout your experiment. And now I want to look at the following question. What dictates the height our object reaches? Or how would we find our height h? Well, we could find our, <coughs> we could find our height h 
by using the following formula. So this formula is one of the formulas that we used when we spoke about linear motion, where, where we had constant acceleration. And so we basically know this guy, we know this guy, we know what our acceleration, what we don't know is our height. So we basically rearrange this formula to find this formula. And now we simply plug in our values and we get our height. Now notice for the case above where our speed or where our velocity was 5 meters per second, we can plug in our values and we find that our height in meters is 1.27 meters. Now, notice that the height depends strictly on the vertical velocity as well as the acceleration. It does not depend on the horizontal velocity. Now, this distance, however, this displacement depends on both the time as well as the vertical or the horizontal velocity. And because the time is found using our uh, vertical velocity, then that means displacement two depends on two factors, the time as well as the horizontal velocity. Because to find the horizontal velocity, we simply take our, or to find our distance or displacement of the ball, we simply take our horizontal velocity and multiply it by our time. And we get our distance or displacement traveled by this ball.